necklace? Or is that a different um, symbol? Or is so it the same thing? It, it's related, yeah. It's a it's a koru. So they definitely use that symbol in Moana. Yeah. Um, it is so it was given to me in Hawaii by somebody that I met there while I was visiting the big island. Um, Very cool. Developed, uh, you know, friendship relatively quickly um, with a guy and his brothers there who had grown up in Hawaii, uh, who had lived on, um, uh, I just woke up and haven't caffeinated yet. So I'm trying to remember the well, name. Grab some coffee, man. The small, well, I, I have it. I just haven't drank most of it. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, uh, I'm forgetting the exact name of the small little island that um, it's just off the coast of Kauai, uh, owned by the um, yeah, my brain is not working yet. Oh, it'll, just, it'll get there. The there's a family that um, that owns like a they own this small island basically, and they have kept well, they've kept it for um, effectively the indigenous peoples of Hawaii. Wow. Um, although there's a lot of drama involved given that they are relatively strict within um, the context of uh, those who live on the island, what's allowed, what's not allowed. So a good amount of people uh, move off the island, but it's like a one-way door. Once you leave, you can't really come back. I mean, you can visit your family and stuff like that, but you can't actually uh, move back. Wow. Anyhow, um, the guy who made it, you know, he actually grew up there and um, he and his family had moved off. So they still had a lot of the traditions um, that they'd grown up with one of which was actually hunting wild boar and carving from the bones and so this necklace was actually uh, made and carved hand carved by uh, this man who killed it killed a wild boar hunted a wild wow. boar carved it and then uh, he had been wearing it for about maybe six months or so um, and then he gave it to me and he gave it to me uh, contingent upon the acceptance of the terms that I don't take it off. So, wow. Um, yeah, I, I now wear it, uh, all the time. It's a Koru. I've been wearing it for about two and a half years now. Um, the symbol is a symbol of, of new life, rebirth, new beginnings. Uh -huh. supposed to symbolize, um, it's, it's concrete target is a, um, or the image in nature from which it derives is that of a, unfurling palm frond so like yeah, a, yeah. Like a palm or a, sorry a fern frond so yeah. like a, a fern is um a spiral right and then as it unfurls it becomes its leaf right um, that's beautiful yeah so that's that's that that's the story of the necklace that's really <laughs> really cool uh, two things from that uh i'd love to hear more about it we'll have to talk about travel sometime and uh just really cool that you were able to kind of interact with those kinds of people um mm -hmm. and then two it's people uh, are crazy, man. It's amazing. Yeah, it's yeah. Amazing what happens when you, when you give people the opportunity to connect. Absolutely. And then two, it's, uh, I wouldn't say I'm happy, but it's nice to see that your, your mind isn't always working at such a high, uh, a high frequency that, that I've seen in, in your other content and, uh, in our last meeting. Cause it was just like, how does this man keep this brain going like this? But, uh, but it's nice to see that you at least have to wake up like the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah. it, uh, i mean it's it's the brain it, it's amazing the more i've tried to push my own boundaries the more it's it's a strange relationship between um between kind of the edge of one's capabilities and the sensitivity to uh external influences on the ability to actually to remain in that domain oh yeah um, so it's like now that now that most of what I'm doing is kind of at the horizon of my capabilities, uh, mm, it's, it's far easier for me to, to not be able to actually work given that I actually need to align quite a few variables in a way that, yeah. uh, that allows me to, to kind of stay there for long enough to, to get meaningful work done. So talk about some of those variables for me. Cause I, I, I know exactly what you're talking. I know that feeling. Yeah. Well, there's the simple things which are, mm -hmm you know, the basics of exercise, uh, food and sleep. Right. So relatively stable patterns, um, having a good breakfast, which I haven't eaten this morning because I just got up because I was up too late. <laughs> so it's <laughs> Is like, that when you find your most creative, I, I, I have, I have all of these patterns working against me. 
Um, yes and no, mm -hmm. right? It's like I I have. Uh, yeah, I definitely have that you know, kind of gene or just cognitive and behavioral pattern in which my mind will begin to race at night and it's yeah. highly associative and, and, and divergent in its, mm -hmm. in, in its patterns of association. Yep. And that is often a source of, that's often a source of seeds of new ideas. They, they aren't fully formed. They aren't right. anything that would be communicable um, meaningfully externally. But that is where a lot of the ideas tend to emerge from. The unfortunate part about that is that, you know, when I, when my mind gets spinning, uh, it can take me from, you know, two to four hours to, to calm down enough to actually sleep. And Same here. Yeah. 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 And so, and so that can cause a series of cascading effects that you know, impacts right. the next day, two days, yep. or, you know, three days, depending on. Um, just how, you know, just, just how much I'm able to actually sleep. Like if I, if I can actually sleep, you know, if I don't have anything to do the next day, it just starts tending to shift my entire schedule. Right. right. So it now, pushes it back. Yeah. Without, and so my girlfriend is also traveling right now. She went to New York and then she's going to Berlin. So she's going to be gone. She's going to be gone for two weeks. And in a way she's like, she's kind of my anchor to reality. Yeah. I was uh, going to say, yeah. <laughs> especially like, because I've been staying up till 5 a.m. writing down all my ideas. I mean, not that that's a, that's a, that's a bad thing. It's a good thing to orient you towards like a, a, a better schedule, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Otherwise be up till five, six, just writing things down for every yeah, single night. Yeah. And that's the hard thing. I, 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 it seems, I'm not really sure why this is. And I haven't done a huge amount of research into um, these types of circadian rhythms in terms of why they might become dilated. Uh, though I think to some extent I have like a naturally like 30 to 36 hour rhythm. If I'm left to my own devices, mm. it's very strange. Like I will, um, I'll just start cycling through days and nights. You know what I mean? Like I'll stay up for, um, 18 to 20 hours and then sleep eight hours or something like that. Right. Right. Um, well, that's what we do. If you think back in high school, I don't know if you did this, but during the summer, it would be like you'd stay up as late as possible. I remember constantly staying up till the sun came up. And then my parents had a room that was uh, in the basement. It was a concrete room, like unfinished uh, room in the basement. And I just, I slept there because there was no light that would come in. I'd sleep for eight to 10 hours and then go do it all over again. So, mm -hmm. but I, it, you feel like you're in the zone. I don't, it's hard to describe exactly. Um, real quick, can you, can you go back and talk about when you're, when you're doing those periods of, uh, you know, of, um, of creativity at, at night. Do you, do you record yourself with a voice recorder with your phone? Do you write the things down? Um, cause I'm, I'm really interested in doing some, I guess, research and organizational strategizing myself and how mm -hmm. I get all these ideas down and organize them. Um, and I'd, I'd be really curious to hear how, what your process looks like in that, in that regard. Yeah, I, I don't, I wouldn't say that I have a strict process around it. It's somewhat contingent upon what the idea is mm -hmm. and that uh, that lends itself to various formats. Usually they aren't voice formats just because I've found that when I want to engage with lookup of those ideas, voice formats are a bit harder for me to refer back to. So here's Otter. Use Otter for that. Um, it's a new app. It, it transcribes your, your thoughts mm -hmm. and then it gives you time stamped, uh, you know, paragraphs, sentences, and you can click it and it takes you right back to your recording. So it does like, I, I've had the exact same problem. That solved that problem for me. Okay, um, I'll I'll take a look. Yeah, I've looked at some before, and they, I haven't I haven't found one that's satisfied my needs yet. But I'll try Otter. Yeah. Um. But other than that, I take notes on my phone. Uh, uh -huh. I've tried a few apps, but I I honestly just keep coming back to the basic notes app. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which is uh, you know a, a blank, you know, even if it's a digital linear uh, piece of paper, quote unquote. Um, right. A blank one seems to be the best. Uh, format for me to begin the seeds of uh, ideas to actually kind of to to write down relatively free flowing ideas and associated mm -hmm. um, you know, associative linguistic patterns. Sometimes not even sentences. Sometimes just associative words. Oftentimes, um, partially formed ideas. Um, and then, addition, you know, either either in that initial phase or sometimes uh, after that initial phase, 
I start writing things down. So like, you know, I have like random stuff. Holy uh, shit. Can, I, can you, can you, is that like a private journal? Like, or can you, can you um, over that in a little more detail? Yeah, it's like, there's all sorts of stuff in here. Um, oh. it's, it's kind of private. Okay, cool. Cool. Definitely respect uh, that. It's like, there's also some art and stuff in there, dude. But like, that's really cool. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I, I use this for random. Well, even it's not random actually. It's not random at all. Nothing's um, right. 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 Random is the, the, the static on the, on the screen. Right. It's, so then I, yeah, I use that for visual thinking. I use that to try to take some of the ideas from the linguistic domain that were kind of like placeholders in my mind that, were low dimensional projections from what I see because, and I don't know how common this is, but when I think, I, I think in images and I know, exactly. images, yeah, yeah. You know, those images kind of take over my field of consciousness when I'm thinking. So like my eyes, even when I'm talking, um, I, I've noticed like my eyes will move around or like I'll close my eyes uh-huh. and, um, almost as if I'm using my visual system to search inside of me, which is very strange. Um, no, that but, makes complete sense. But I think, you know, I've, I've done a lot of thinking on, on why that might be the case as well. There aren't any good theories to explain it neurophysiologically yet that I've come across, but I have some intuitions of my own. Um, in any case. Guys, love to hear them. <laughs> <laughs> I, want to, I want to dig deep, man. I want to know. I don't want to know how you think. So, you think? well, just without going too deeply into it, um, within the nervous system, everything is connected. The entire nervous system is a large graph. And parts of that graph are in contact with sensorium, the outside world, uh, communicated by uh, evolved mechanisms, such as your eyes, your ears, um, your nerve receptors throughout your skin. Um, relatively low resolution stuff though taste buds olf- olfactory system right well right. i mean visuals like depends on what you Rel- what i mean, mean you know, your lower high resolution requires a baseline and so right you know, right um, it lower than lower than i think uh an average person gives it credit for so uh, in other words what you what you can't see i, I feel like is is immediately thought of as not present or not there not affecting your current s- situation Things like the flow of time, like we've talked about the data wake, um, mm-hmm. th- those affect everything. Everything affects everything. And so what we see right now is, is just such a, re- a relatively limited realm, but it's assumed to be more than that. It's assumed, it's almost in an arrogant fashion, I feel like. But that, that could just be me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I, I think there's truth to that. Yet even in what we, what we do see, the, you know, there's an immense complexity that is um, unprocessable in our conscious reality. Mm-hmm. But you know, with respect to what I was saying, you can kind of look at it as a, like a graph, a, you know, think yeah. of the graph in like a circular format. Yep. Um, or then you take the graph that's a circle and you rotate it so that you, you're kind of looking at it um, on, on the plane, right? Uh, okay. Horizontally. And then you take the center and you extrude it down. So you're kind of, you have something that's like um, you know, a gravity well or something like that. Right. And then, so you would think of the the elements of you that make contact with the external world as the edges of this gravity well, perceptual gravity well. Look at it that way. Um, and then, if that's the case, or if that's the metaphor that we're working with, then we have some ability to exert a um, you know a you may call it conscious or non-conscious, but we exert some ability to control the directional. Um, uh, the directional orientation of those sense apparatus such that we can parameterize the information that's flowing into the graph based on the information that we are uh, interested in exploring relative to our goals, right? So if I see something on the horizon uh, that interests me, I will orient both my body and my eye, well, first my head and my eyes towards right. it. I will look at it, which will change the relative flow of visual information, right? Right. And then I will orient my body and potentially I'll walk over to it, which will then perhaps immerse the rest of my sensorium within a, uh, an environment that is more highly associated with whatever the target of my experience was. Right. So in that way we are able to, um, shift our, uh, shift the orientation of our sensory apparatus such that we can change the perceptual ecosystem in which we are acting. And, 
Um, and that happens externally, but that is obviously external is a strange word because what's happening right. externally is conducted. You only are aware of what's happening externally as conducted by uh, your sense organs. Once things are interacting with your sense organism, right? Sense organs, and and therefore, you know, and this has obviously been explored like uh, philosophically to a large extent. Um, so I won't re rehash it, but you know, it, it's hard to really say what's external and because of the fact that it's entirely mediated by sense perception. Um, okay. So this is all happening in this, this way that we consider external. And so we're searching through it and we're navigating through it. Right. So now let's go all the way back to the beginning of the question, which was yeah. well, why might we, you know, why might one move one's eyes while one's eyes are closed to quote unquote search one's internal space. And I think it's because there's a symmetry there, given that what's inside is largely created by what has been outside. We have the ability to potentially shift and parameterize the network dynamics of what's happening within the brain by moving the sense organs that are typically associated with feeding that system, right? Mm. So because the nervous system of the eyeballs is connected to uh, what's happening inside because what's happening inside was a downstream product of what came in through the eyeballs shifting the eyeballs around while thinking is a way of potentially parameterizing what parts of the internal cognitive network are being up or down regulated now, let's pause that right there because i mean think about during REM sleep you have the rapid eye movement right i mean yep. during REM sleep so yeah, I, yeah. I, and I've, I've been thinking about drive. I've been having a couple of just really vivid dreams and I don't usually dream because like you, the sleep is just not regulated. It's not regulated enough for, for those, whatever, whatever conditions need to be there. So, but I've thought of, I mean, the dreams as a, is the brain's ultimate abstraction mechanism. It takes thing, it takes concepts, archetypes, stereotypes, cliches, all these things, and it puts them together in a flow. That, that's telling you something, right? It, stop me if you don't agree with something, though, because it's just kind of like kind of out there. And then so on that I mean, same, not, I mean, that's not that out there. That's that's yeah. in line with all sorts of speculation with respect to dreams. It's, it's speculation over, the past, over right. the past, you know, uh, I don't even know, perhaps a thousand, you know, thousands of years. Cool. Uh, in terms of depending on how you in, in, interpret people's commentary on dreams. Right. And so, and so you, you almost have like the eye as the spindle creating this thing. You know, as as the eye moves, it's it's like. It, it's relative to the ab abstraction that you're applying to the thoughts. Um, and I've, I've just been thinking in terms of abstractions and hierarchies and trying to like piece all these different disparate ideas together um, mm -hmm. and, and exploring language in the same, at the same time, trying to figure out, you know, solve my problem of, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you apply a number to, to a, a feeling or a principle or something like mm -hmm. that? Cause that's ultimately the challenge that needs to be tackled hypothetically right now. And, mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about when you look for, you, you see the thing you're describing, you know, juxtaposed upon like this, it's almost like a, a heads up display in, in VR, right? Kind of, we've got our image right here that we're kind of looking at thinking about, and then you're exploring it visually and trying to explain it. Um, and I, I, I just really, really you definitely align with that idea. I think that's fascinating. And I think you're, I think you're, Especially with the the gravity, what do you call it? Gravity funnel. What are those technically called? Uh, gravity well. Gravity well. Yeah, I mean it, that that shape too. I've been I've been picturing that shape in different in different realms as well um, to explain different things um, that I'd love to get into if we have time. But um, I, I just that's yeah. No, I think that that shape is uh, those types of that you know those domains of curvature are 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 elements of. A conceptual realm that are applicable to, to many metaphorical structures in ways yeah. that are that are quite appropriate. Um, with respect to the dream comment, I would just add, I suppose that uh, these types of systems, there's a historical hangover that tends towards looking at something like eye movements and sleep and many other elements of behavior as epiphenom epiphenomena or afterthoughts of, of conscious intent. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, we have this observation of somebody. Now think about pre-scientifically, they're dreaming, their eyes are closed. You can tell their eyes are moving because you can see the eyes moving underneath the eyelids. Mm -hmm. um, but the consciousness or the, the, the quote unquote um, idea of their, their presence in their body. Their wakeness. 
their right. wake, oh, you know, wakefulness or however, wakefulness, we, right. however one would want to conceptualize that right. um, is, you know, as perceived by pre-scientific minds, not there, not present, right? Um, or perhaps inside resting or, you know, it, it is not at the surface. It is not able to be interacted with in the normal conscious manner. Um, but the eyes are still moving, right? So it's almost as if there's a spirit animating Mm-hmm. Right. The eyeballs. That's like a part of some process happening inside. Right. It's just, and it's just like there's this external afterthought of, of eyeball movement. I and mean, in some ways, we still apply these um, these these concepts that are ingrained into our you know ingrained into the perceptual and cultural structure of like a pre-scientific understanding of these systems, which is understandable because that was how we developed our, our relationships to one another in the first place. But so you have this idea of, of unless you are consciously associated and present with your eyeballs and looking outwards that whatever they're doing is useless or whatever they're doing mm-hmm. is, is a byproduct of whatever happening inside, as opposed yeah. to the, the fact that, you know, there might be an integral element of REM sleep that requires the eyeballs to um, rapidly orient, you know, rapidly reorient themselves. It's it's unclear as to what function that's actually serving with respect to how it feeds back on the network that it's connected to, uh, because we just don't have the tools necessary to understand or even ask a question like that just yet. Although mm-hmm. we're beginning, we're beginning to develop those tools. So, right. you know, Fascinating you know, FM- to look at. Yeah. FMRI might be at a point now where, where we could ask a question like that. I'm not aware that anyone has asked that question. But well, there's that, FMRI yeah. and isn't there, well, they, the, they apply machine learning to the FMRI data to produce an image of something that was seen by the, um, by the participant. Is it something like that? Um, that would be an example of the type of maybe an example of something uh, similar to what I'm talking about. Yeah, but you'd have to. I mean, that's just that's just basically um, when you really read that study, it is relatively limited in its scope because right, it's um, pretty sure what was being. I forget exactly how they. Exactly how they actually constructed the study. It looks, but it looks was like something. They showed, yeah, they showed something, and it was it was like they were aware of what was shown, um, and they were recording the fMRI data, like when the actual image was shown as well. Mm-hmm. And then they tried to like reverse engineer the image from that fMRI data, or something along those lines. Something like that. Yeah, and and the thing about that is that you know. It's giving it's giving the algorithm a, a a leg up that wouldn't be there in a typical situation. Yeah, you're conceptually anchoring right the situation. And when you look at the the images that are the that are the product of that, you know, even though they're getting kind of close, um, even though they're getting kind of close to recreating that image, they if one were to just look at the image, you'd have no idea what it is. First of all, mm-hmm. second of all, it's it's Cheating in a sense where it's like, you know, a singular image, uh, even if it's like, you know, a singular image or even like a series of images, like creating like a low resolution video of, of the brain's action or just Uh basically like spying on it and then recreating the, the pattern to reproduce an image that looks somewhat similar says very little about how that, you know, it says very little about like how that image gives rise to the concept of like meaning or semantic apprehension. Right. Right. So, you know, it's one of these things where even though it appears or is pitched in the media as if this is something we that can read, read dreams. Yeah. Yeah. Click reading bait. dreams. Uh, yeah, exactly. It, it, the reality of the situation is that we're still quite far from having not only high resolution maps of what's happening in the brain, but you know, I'm not a sh- I'm not really sure we've made any steps at all towards actually associating that with the internal semantic mapping of consciousness that right. associates with whatever's playing in the theater of the mind. Right. 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 Um, not only is it is it kind of trying to cheat a little bit, but it's also if it were to succeed in the goal it was cheating to get towards, 
we still wouldn't have exactly what they say we'd have from these these clickbait articles and these songs. yeah yeah and and the the real danger in that comes into you know the real danger in that comes to the fore when you start considering how that applies to certain social systems upon which the integrity of our society uh, depends such as the legal system and you know looking at these looking at these um looking at these technologies, if you consider the fact that there are certainly people in these systems whose interests align with the notion that if you could create a system that mm-hmm. read minds, yeah. um, they would like to have that technology. Now, right. the extent to which they are, you know, to, to the extent to which their anticipatory um, desires affect their responsibility to the deep ethics of, of a question like that and the potential downstream side effects and the extent to which they're going to actually balance that appropriately is a massive ethical issue, right? Like, cause introducing, introducing technologies like that are kind of a one way door. Once they're introduced, it's very difficult to get rid of them. Even with something as simple as the lie detector test, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. You look at how deeply the, the concept of the polygraph has embedded itself. You know, we, we've, to some extent resisted it in, in some elements of our legal domain now, but just look at how deeply it's embedded itself within our culture, right? Mm-hmm. Even if, even within the life, even within the legal system, even if it's not acceptable, um, in, you know, as particular types of evidence, uh, it's still used in television shows, uh, <laughs> or movies with yeah. respect to legal concepts and frameworks that then seed the public's conception of what is fair or what is mm-hmm. possible. Right. Um, and, and because we live in a democracy, those types of public perceptions of fairness or possibility or potential or the relationship between technology and ethics um, are not trivial, <laughs> given that they actually govern the laws that will be, uh, you know, the laws coming down the pipeline that will be either accepted or rejected by, by a democratic society. Yeah. So, and I think on that, on that same thread there, you know, talking about it's going to happen. It's, I mean, uh, just look at Elon Musk's neural lace, right? That's, that's going to happen. Let's say, let's give it 10 years. It's a reasonable five to 10 years. What's up? Uh, I need to figure out a way to, to stop. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you right now. I need to figure out a way to stop my phone from, so it's like, this is the beauty of the digitally connected age. My, my iPhone is uh-huh. associated with my MacBook Pro. And so when my phone rings here, it effectively takes over the audio uh, and you know, the inputs and outputs right. of everything associated with my laptop, um, which is <laughs> okay in most contexts, but obviously not okay when I'm doing a video recording. And you so, feel like Zoom would be able to say, give, force, yeah, force exactly. us to retain control of the audio. You, you would think so, right? Uh, like, yeah. <laughs> the iPhone hears all, right? Zoom, Zoom, Zoom needs like a hashtag resist, right? <laughs> um, but yeah. it doesn't have it. And so I'm uh. kicked my table. Um, yeah, so that keeps happening. And that was my girlfriend. So I should call her back when we Oh, no worries. Do you, do you need to? Uh, um, no, it's, it's, it's okay. We'll, it's, it's fine. She's, yeah, I'm sure she's, uh, we just, uh, we haven't spoken since she actually left. I and mean, we've talked by a chat. Right. We haven't spoken since she went to, to London. Right to New York first. Um, so, just that, on that same note of the neural lace, right? So uh, it won't. Uh, you still there? Yeah. Yeah. So it won't. It won't happen as if you know some uh, some Chinese mandated system, but it'll happen in the same way that we have uh, smart devices and cell phones and every, like all the data is going to a centralized location. So long as decentralization in mass hasn't happened by the time that technology proliferates. So it's almost like a race to see who we allow to read our minds because that technology will happen. And I mean, it, it's almost inevitable. And if it happens in the same way that Google and Facebook and, you know, Amazon, oh, we're going to read your mind to see what you want to search for. We're going to read your mind to see what you want to buy. And it's like, oh, well, you can also read my mind the rest of the time when I'm not, when I'm not wanting you to. Or if there's a way to say, don't read my mind right now and then turn it off, you know, if there's something like that, then. And that would be maybe good, but it's, it's a very dangerous thing to, to walk down. Certainly. Yeah. Um, I, it, it, there's, there's many layers to that question. Um, I think last time we talked, I mentioned an article that I was writing. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I saw you released the first bit. 
Well, there's two. So that was the one on on the actual history and evolution of value and our you know the systems that we've the systems that we've externalized to. Yeah, to great writing by value. the way. I got through a little bit of it with some some commentary, but fantastic writing. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I'm planning on publishing a, you know the next section of it either today or tomorrow. Probably tomorrow. I, I need to actually create those images that yeah. um, you know that need to be inserted. That I actually I think you saw in the draft form. Right. Um, which is actually one one of those pages that I showed you earlier in in my notebook. Uh, oh, so you draw those? What? You draw you draw the images that you put in there? You don't find those, <clears throat> or like those aren't you didn't find the images and then think things about them? Like you you create those images? Well, the ones that I'm going to create for this article are are purely from my mind because they don't cool. exist in the world yet. Um, yeah. they are they're derivative in the sense that their seeds are derivative, but yeah. the images themselves and the concepts are as far as I can tell, original. Um, that being said, nothing new under the sun, right? I am a downstream function of you know, all pre-existing reality. So, um, yeah, with respect to well, that article, I have it written. I was going to, it's, I don't know, it's, it's a very strange, I'm not really sure what's going on. Uh, I was asked to write it by... Uh, uh, the publisher by Quillette, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was asked to write by them, and I was I was speaking with her on Twitter. We were like editing it, and then she's just dropped off the map. So I'm not sure if she just got extremely busy, or she did um, have that meeting recently with uh, with Jordan Peterson. I wonder if she's getting like just flooded with uh, maybe, maybe. I don't know if that's what's going on, or if I'm being ghosted, or what the hell's going on. Yeah. I, I obviously trying to take a generous interpretation, but at this point, oh, it's course. been you know. I she asked me to write it, and I wrote it in. 24 hours, the first draft. So yeah. uh, one might call that responsive. Um, <laughs> Which, yeah, yeah, that's very. Yeah. And so I wrote it and then it took a while for, you know, and then we kind of like cycled a little bit, but it took a while for me to even get any feedback on it. And then what, what was yeah, the topic of that one again? Can you remind me? It's called digital slavery and, or sorry, data slavery and digital em emancipation. Right. And you can't, you, I know you can't talk about it too much or anything, but I just, wouldn't. I can talk about it. I'm, I'm going to publish it myself. Actually, at yeah. this point, I'm, at this point, I'm just like, you know, it would have been nice, but I don't really, I, I, I care more about having the ideas out there when they need to be out there in the ecosystem of ideas, than who's publishing them, even though, you know, it would be nice to have them published. Um, more widely or, or in other publications, but that can come later. It's fine. It's like people, people are responding to some of the work, so it's not really a big deal who publishes it. Um, let's, see, let's plan a, let's plan a comeback quick flag right there. Um, was there anything else you wanted to go into on, on that, on that topic? Cause I've got something related to, you know, publishing feedback and, and that kind of thing that I want to talk to you about. Yeah. I mean, the reason, the reason I brought it up is because there are these two models of, the way that we manage the data in our ecosystems um, and the game theory associated with those two models lead to very different futures. And one, one model looks a lot like what, you know, it looks like the path that China is taking steps down at the moment mm -hmm. with respect to their citizen scores, right. uh, with respect to taking all the information about your life uh, and centralizing it under the auspices of, or under the aegis of, uh, of political coordination. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the state has access not only to all of your data, but also to, um, they also have the right to connect that to uh, your capacity as an individual person, as an individual citizen of the state um, to move freely, either physically, economically, uh, personally within the right. society uh, of which you're a part. And centralizing that power, that capacity in the hands of the state uh, requires the state to create a centralized authority, a centralized moral authority, a centralized value system, effectively, yeah. right? And, and therefore, um, it's, it's a dictatorial creation of a centralized value system. It is inherently authoritarian, and it is uh, enhanced, it is catalyzed, it's amplified dramatically by technology. Mm -hmm. uh, previously, the only reason, in many ways, the reason why authoritarian structures would fail was because of the fact that they, you know, they would succumb to the immense and overwhelming complexity in, in the world and their centralized approach to managing that complexity would crumble in the face of, uh, of the complexity itself. Now, 
with the use of technology as a crutch or as a as a um, as a mechanism by which to prop up authoritarianism. If one can get that right, if one can scale that authoritarianism technologically, uh, it's unclear as to what the limits of growth are. And they have a competitive advantage with respect to higher degrees of coordination and the ability to leverage resources uh, with more, um, I wouldn't necessarily call it coherence because that, uh, that implies more of a bottom up coordination, mm -hmm. but you know, with more agency, collective agency, yeah. right? Yeah. And so I think I made a tweet about this just the other night, which is like, I really do see the 21st century as this group selection, uh, the, this domain of collective evolution in which the group selection um, is going to be largely parameterized by the way in which we coordinate and balance, so the way in which we co coordinate group or collective action at a large scale and balance that with individual autonomy and freedom mm -hmm. um, and, and, and use technology to mediate that relationship. And, and China is taking the top down approach in which right. they're using it to effectively enforce a centralized authoritarian structure of values and then uh, technolo technologically mediate that in their society and enforce it. And then the other side of the coin is what seems to be emerging in the cryptocurrency landscape in the landscape of creating bottom-up emergent value systems that are um, interoperable and decentralized that allow for us to, in a world where everything is recorded, still mediate in a bottom-up fashion um, boundaries of individual autonomy that allow us to um, surface a collective landscape of values that we can, you know, within which we can economically and interpersonally negotiate, um, and from which we can derive immense amounts of, of value. Though, much like democracy, those types of bottom-up systems require high levels of coherence and coordination to act as collective agents, right? Um, it's, it's, it's far harder to get a democracy to build a hundred uh, interconnected high-speed railways like China has done over the past right. you know, five to seven years. Um, in California, it's taking us 25 to 30 years just to create one uh, high-speed railway that's not even a high-speed railway that's using technology from 30 to 40 years ago that by the time it is built will be so obsolete that it might as well have never been created. Um, and and doing so has been an immense effort that is I think you know it's estimated at sixty billion dollars, but is is likely going to be more than that. So these these are the trade offs um, between you know efficacy, efficiency, and you know ethical morality when it comes to these top down and bottom up trade offs. And the issue is game theoretic. The issue is is an evolutionarily game theoretic one, which is um, which of these can out compete one another over the long run, and if the authoritarian model is efficient enough to quote unquote infect the landscape and take mm -hmm. over in the short term um, and exterminate the seeds of bottom up organization, even if the bottom up organization might be playing a more long term stable game. Um, the hyper coordinated authoritarianism mediated technologically might be able to displace it. Right. And if that happens, that's a very bad day for anybody who appreciates the, the philosophical, epistemological, or ethical roots of uh, Western civilization, of, of Western civilization, right. of democracy, of, right. of, of the, the sovereignty of the individual over of the individual over the state. sovereign of individual sovereignty. Any of these any of these concept, concepts or, or ideas, you mm -hmm. know, you kiss those goodbye um, via this this path. So I think it's imperative that we that we start looking at this in those we start looking at this geopolitical frame in those terms because the terms in which we're addressing it now that are you know historical byproducts of um of a much more antiquated way of looking at uh you know geopolitical relationships or or, or state you know uh, interstate relationships um is is not as useful we need a much more evolutionary perspective we need a pers we need a game theoretic perspective that is not um that is not looked at through uh, you know, whose lens is not blurred through through the myopic frame of kind of warfare that that has tended to um, that has tended to weigh more heavily upon the game theoretic conversations than many other uh, 
hyper, what I would consider hyper relevant considerations in the 21st century. So for example, like I'm saying, like I, I consider this, this question about how to organize the information flow uh, analogous to the idea of what kind of a nerve system do you want to instill in the evolutionary organism as the collective intelligence emerges? Uh, well, I and, saw you tweeting about religion yesterday and how, well, science is the religion of, I, I forget the exact tweet you said. I, by the way, if I ever just go on a tweeting spree where I respond to everything, every single tweet you said, it just <laughs> ignore that. won't hurt my feelings. I just like everything you say, I've got a, I feel like I've got a response to. Um, no, it's respond, respond yeah. by all means. Um, and that yeah. also along those lines, I know you sent over some, some material. I haven't, oh, yeah. yet, I haven't yet had the ability to, to go through it just because this week has been, um, yeah, I've, I've been, I've been, I've been trying to work on a few other things that I have sure. external obligations to, to finish. Let's, let's talk about that in a second. Cause, uh, well, I, I know you probably have to get off in about 15, 20 minutes. You have a hard cutoff. Yeah, I'm supposed to be on a call at 10:30. Okay, cool. So you want to you want to say 20 more minutes, or did you need to do something between the calls? Or you, what, yeah, what, 20, or, 20 or 25 more minutes is fine. I don't. The next call, it's it's. I have to be on it, but it's fairly casual. I'm planning okay. on, planning on cooking eggs while while. Speaking, so <laughs> oh, okay, so so more of a soft 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> but uh, so on that on that note, I've been. Uh, who was it? Was it Piaget that was trying to? to consolidate science and religion and, and the purpose of that or whoever it was, um, or was it, uh, Jacques Panksepp or whoever it was? Um, I've, I've heard. Well, I mean, Peter. yeah, man, man, many people have, uh, who's, who's, have attempted that, but Piaget is one person that he Piaget. references. Um, he references Piaget, um, and, and kind of like the driving motivation of someone like Piaget as, as unifying science and religion, um, perceptually or in the eyes of, or like at least, at least breaking down some of the barriers, that have led many to consider them irreconcilable. Right. Uh, and, and you know, Peterson also talks about Carl Jung in that light. I think both of those are fair analyses. Um, I do think Peterson potentially perceptually upregulates that part of their message because that's also a large part of his platform. Which I think um, we could spend some time talking about that as well. Um, yeah. Well, let me let me just get back. the 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 person is is not quite as relevant as as what I was going to say. But so so I've been trying to think about um think about you know what what it what it means for the death of religion. Why that's why that seems like it's occurred uh, more and more uh, with more rapidity uh, lately. Um, we, obviously, we can't observe exactly before we existed, but we can you know read about it and think about it. And so what what's happening? I feel like is we're losing our you you said uh, the um, the what did you say the orienting uh, force or um, the uh, the driving force between the shared value structures appeared to be religion and then as time moved on it's it it, it came to be that that the religious stories were quite obviously not um, true and so then we have to get into the the tiptoeing around the word true as uh, Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson did but but true in a sense of uh, of, of scientifically rigorous truth. Um, I say this and it can be verified and, you know, we can repeat under the same conditions, that, that kind of but truth. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the delineation. I'm actually going to a salon and leading a discussion on this tomorrow um, about the delineation between, you know, objective, what, would, what, one, what one would consider, um, I guess, perhaps, uh, perhaps objective or analytic truth yeah. and the notion of um, pragmatic or metaphorical truth. Emergent, emergent. I would actually consider emergent truth. Emergent which truth. Is, which is, in, and, and I don't think many people have looked at it through that lens, but I uh -huh. think that's actually a very useful lens. I also made a tweet about the difference between the idea of analytical versus emergent closure, uh, which would be the idea of the, the con concept of closure is like the closure of a, of a loop structure or the closure right. of an enclosure, right? And, and an kind of like a logical, it goes all the way around, like like an Ouroboros almost kind of goes around and you can yeah. conclude. Yeah, and so from. like they think about just the basic idea of, a, of an enclosure or a circle, closing a circle. Um, yeah. What, what do we, what is the purpose of that? What is the structure of that? Well, if you look at that topologically, what you're actually doing, you know, you can bend, uh, you can take a line and bend it in all sorts of ways and you really haven't topologically done much at all. But as soon as you connect the endpoints together, you've effectively created two spaces, an inside and an outside, right? Mm -hmm. Created, you know, the internal part of the circle and the outside part of the circle. And this is 
highly relevant to every structure at every level of perceived reality. Take it, take it one step further and say that it's, it's an enclosure in terms of like N minus one dimensional space and in space. Cause, cause if you just say a circle, it's limited to two dimensions, right? But if you, then you do a sphere and then a hypersphere and there's, there's always things inside and outside of those, those enclosures, right? Yeah. So, uh, so I'm, I'm trying to limit the metaphor to ah, yeah, okay. a dimensionally simplistic realm just right. because, you know, the, the more dimensions you add, the more uh, complexity we add that might not necessarily be, um, that, that might not be necessary to, to the, the conceptual seeds we're trying to get at here. So right. the conceptual seeds I'm, I'm trying to get at or, or trying to point to here are, you know, are the notion that we create enclosures to create boundaries between inside and outside, between the notion that there exist, uh, there exist meaningful distinctions between, uh, groupings of perceptions, right? So it's like, we'll create a word to try to actually encapsulate um, an idea. Well, what the hell is a word encapsulating an idea? Like, mm -hmm. that's a very strange thing to consider when we actually really start unpacking the notion that we use our vocal cords to manipulate the air so that we send signals via other people's auditory channels to mm -hmm. somehow wrap that conceptual structure around parts of the world, right? Mm -hmm. But those conceptual structures that we wrap around parts of the world, either physical or conceptual, that we call words, are inherently incomplete in a way. Well, they're, um, so they're so low resolution. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's deeply relevant to the resolution, yeah. uh, the resolution issue. Uh, or there's, it's, also, it's also deeply tied to notions like Gödel's incompleteness theorem, given that any sufficiently expressive system uh, of, of axiomatically any axiomatically derived system, and there are other there are other axioms that make Gödel's insights formally possible with respect to formal mathematical systems. But I'm going to play a little fast and loose here. Um, so, sure, any yeah. mathematicians who ever potentially see this, please forgive me. Um, let's just say that you know, as soon as you have an axiomatically derived system of sufficient expressivity you're going to start generating these, these contradictions, right? And when you start generating these contradictions, so there's a couple of things. You, you, you both start generating contradictions within the, the logical framework of whatever system you've created or the axiomatic framework of whatever system you've created. And simultaneously, the system that you've created is going to remain uh, insufficient to express all the truths possible. Um, within that framework, right? Which is like, this is a weird dichotomy. And I know we've gotten kind of far from where we began, but I'm going to try to bring it back to, to, the, notion of, uh, to the notion of science and religion and to the notion of, of this evolution of, um, of like these conceptual spaces. Cool, so, let's do that. And then uh, we'll come back to uh, uh, the, uh, the, sh the sharing thoughts idea then, and that, and then we'll, we can probably wrap up. Sure, sure. Um, and so... We have, we have this deep inability to fully enclose reality using axiomatically generated uh, logical or rational structures. Right? That, doesn't mean they're, that doesn't mean they're not useful. They are highly capable pragmatic tools to help us um, orient our own personal actions, orient our collective cooperation to build systems based upon um, elements of reality that seem to remain stable over time that we can represent symbolically, which would be, you know, the field of engineering, for mm -hmm. example. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, that those symmetries are inherently real or truthful. And that's kind of what I was getting at with the tweet with, with respect to science uh, and religion right. science as a religion which is i think it was something along the lines of science is um, a religion that worships um you know worships the increasingly um uh what was it the it is like the increasing utility of of symmetries between symbol systems of symbols and our observations yeah right? yeah, yeah. Um, that, that increasingly gives us the the power to manipulate like systems that capture some part of reality, 
so that, 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 that would be like symmetric, therefore. Like you have the system of symbols, and then you have the observed reality. But obviously, the symbols only encapsulate some subset of the actuality of, of the system in which we exist. And so, and we call that science right now. But the weird thing is that it's always been that way even before we labeled it science. It, it's just that what we've seen recently is an explosion in the pragmatic capacity of the symbolic systems mm -hmm. to um, encapsulate an exponentially larger amount of reality in an exponentially more stable and predictive manner, right? But that doesn't mean... Which is directly related to the, the evolution of technology too. Yeah, right. evolution of technology, but also like, you know, our religions were also directly relevant to the evolution of our previous technology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, just because that technology was, you know, it took far longer to create and it was far less generalizable in time and space. Right. Um, doesn't mean that the phenomenological reality in which we existed uh, and in which we conceptualized our religious narratives and stories um, wasn't serving the exact same function, right? Because it was. It was serving the exact same function of helping us to coordinate our shared experiences such that we could map a symmetry between a symbolic structure, at that point, purely language, not mathematics, um, and the domain of, of lived experience or perceived experience for long enough to coordinate in somewhat complex agglomerations uh, or assemblages of human beings that, you know, or whose capacity extended beyond the capacity of any single individual and therefore bootstrapped mm. humanity into higher states of, of you know, uh, higher levels of adaptive capacity is kind of what I'm calling it in terms of, you know, they extended, they extended the domain of situations for which they were prepared. Right? Yeah. Or, yeah. or with or with which they could um, deal uh, meaningfully, given their conceptual frameworks and technologies at that point, right? Um, and so, there, it, it's it's the difference between religion and science is not a difference in kind. It's you know, it, or you know, it, is, it is a difference in degree. Uh, it's just one of those differences and in methodology degree. as well, too. I think that's important to note. Well. Again, I think uh, or I guess methodology I, I, over time. If you if you look at the time preference of science versus the time preference of religion, it's, it's yeah. Very and so that's the, that's the thing, though. Like I, I actually really don't think like when you really drill down into the methodology of the scientific method, what you get is the the, dis, the distillate, the the essential yeah. nature of of codifying perception in a stable way. Right? It's a formalization, but it doesn't mean that that formalization is necessarily distinct from the process that that precipitated and gave rise to the eventual distillation right, right. Like, so so it's again it's not a different in kind difference in kind it's a formalization of the same process um and and that's why i don't really i used to make the distinction far more clearly between well, religion I'm not, and hold on let's uh, let's i don't want to just take that i i do need to go back and listen to that whole thing you just said but i don't want to just take that and and as is because uh, you know, um, you can't, a religion won't under, under replicable, um, you know, using the scientific method, it won't say, oh yeah, you're right. This is, this is incorrect. It, because you have fundamentalists. You, I don't know if you can have a fundamentalist scientist and a casual scientist. Would you agree? Oh, you, I certainly, think, can. I think, you certainly can. So, so that within, for example, within the scientific domain, certain, certain, people okay certain, group, yeah. certain groups especially led by particular types of individuals will create their own intellectual fiefdoms that very much conform to the notions of fundamentalism um in, in terms of their actions and that's i also okay. agree with people like peterson in terms of you know, what actually matters is the behavioral manifestation not the words right. again right. The words you can break symmetry with reality very easily with words mm -hmm. you cannot break symmetry behaviorally because fundamentally when you break symmetry behaviorally the consequences of that that symmetry breakage will come back very quickly. Well, that's also where you get you get the archetypes, you get the story genres, you get those things because that follows the symmetry you're expecting so closely, and that's yeah. that's why we can understand those so well. And so, like, I would like to clarify, just you know, I I, I don't mean to remove 
significant conceptual distinctions between okay. words like science and words like religion. There right. are reasons for making those distinctions. There are mm -hmm. reasons for, um, for treating these systems differently, especially in the context of a modern society in which those two different systems uh, address very different domains of reality um, and, and have, have quite different spaces of behavioral manifestation with yeah. respect to how those who subscribe to those worldviews or prioritize one over the other tend to behave over time. There's a distinction there. There's a meaningful distinction there. And there's, there's, a useful, um, there's a useful ontology or a useful taxonomy of the evolution of those systems and, and, and distinguishing between them in the same way that creating a taxonomy of, of species or looking at the descendancy of species right. is useful and helps us to understand reality with more granularity and therefore, again, have more predictive capacity, right? Yeah. So it all goes back to that idea. But that doesn't mean that religion... You know, that doesn't, just because you and I are talking over a computer does not mean that what we're doing right now is inherently different from the three to four signaling mechanisms that monkeys can use in trees to talk about things like a bird, a snake, or a lion. Right. Right? Yeah. So, in one way, they are so different in degree that they may as well be different in kind. But in another way, in a very deeply fundamental way, they are not different in kind. Right. In an information theoretic way, they're the exact same thing. Yeah. And so that's sound and, and image to another organism. Yeah. And so from a perspective like mine, who's extremely interested in how the same patterns stack up oh, across yeah. every layer of both time and space and, and complexity, you know, these are the lens through you know this is the lens through which i i see these types of systems and that's why i will say things that at a surface level seem crazy or silly or unjustifiable i've got to say nothing you've said to me seems crazy or unjustifiable it just seems <laughs> like you think thoughts that aren't aren't those idiot i wouldn't call them ideological uh the 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 opposite of the thoughts that you think, but they're not what everybody's saying because people get into echo chambers and you're, I think people, I want to say I group myself in that same group where we're not, we're not saying things that everybody else is saying. We're trying to think outside of those thoughts, which I, I would, I mean, it's, it's, it's philosophizing about everything. Right. Um, and, uh, and so those, those aren't, those aren't going to sound immediately um, true perhaps but it doesn't mean they sound crazy or, or unverifiable. They sound very verifiable. It's just, yeah. it, we need to have these kinds of conversations where I can, I can dig into you and you can dig yeah. into. Well, I've, I've been, I've been trying to communicate some of these ideas and tell me what you think. I, I knew a new little metaphor just popped into my head. So Let's hear it. let me, let me communicate it and see, see where it gets us. See if it, see if it actually takes us somewhere that, uh, that, that might be conceptually fruitful. So imagine a tree. And in this tree, there are different types of animals and, and, and those different types of animals have different skills or different capacities based on how they can move throughout the tree. Now, imagine an animal who can only live on leaves, right? Um, who can only live on leaves, who can't actually ever travel up the leaf back to the branch. Um, now, you can imagine different types of animals that could do this. Um, one type might always live on a single leaf, right? And, and would never leave the leaf. Now, if you could go from leaf to leaf, that allows you to at least explore the canopy, the surface level of the tree, right? Um, that being said, getting from one side of the tree to the other requires you traversing the entire, circum you know, the, the entire surface of the leaves, right? So you have a much farther distance to go. Um, now, there's another type of animal that can actually travel branches, right? And if you can travel branches, not only can you start mapping out how all of the leaves got to where they are, um, but you can also far more quickly and with far more intent um, travel across the, the, the space of leaves. The whole landscape and the, and the, the trees. The whole landscape the and the tree, itself. Yeah. yeah. And, so, and so I think in, in many ways, the tree that I'm talking about is the tree of, of knowledge and the tree of semantic tree of meaning in our society. And 
in a lot of ways, I think that uh, tools like social media, they don't affect everyone the same. But for many people, they turn them into the type of creatures that can only exist in the leaves. Yeah. Uh, they turn them into the type of creatures that, that, that are hyper connected within the surface of the system and don't spend much time crawling back down the branches that gave rise to all of the, the leaves of perception. Right. And, and I think the categorical distinction that you've made earlier is that, you know, we're the other type of creature that enjoys going back into the branches and going and, and mapping the branches. And, you know, when you start mapping the branches, then you start coming to the, the, the connections at which all the branches, you know, connect and then those connect. And then you end up start, you, know, you go deeper and deeper and deeper into more and more fundamental patterns of reality that, you know, have this structure that even though they branch out into something infinitely complex, the further you go back, the more you see the unifications, right? And there, when you do that, you simultaneously see the connections between, you see distinctions where other people don't see distinctions, and you see connections between things that many think are distinct, yeah. <laughs> right? And so, and that's necessary because when you see distinctions you, when you see categorical distinctions where others don't, you can help add nuance to conversations that are otherwise homogenous. And when you see uh, connections between categories that aren't usually surfaced, you can help to bring those parties closer together. You can, you can act as a, a, a channel by which information can be shared. Have you always been kind of thought of as a, as a Switzerland and in in kind of when people disagree, you're just like, hey, we're, we're all kind of thinking the same thing or... Uh, have you been uh, have you been conflict averse in that way? No. <laughs> Interesting. Iron ironically, no. I mean, I can be. I, I certainly can be, and in some contexts, I am. And I'm I'm increasingly trying to play that more that role more frequently. Yeah. That being said, I, from a personality perspective, I have a very I have a very deep disagreeable streak, yeah. and I. Well, yeah, that's okay. As that's well as well as a contrarian streak. Right. And so that can that can easily manifest as, as not necessarily connecting multiple parties, but, but taking just the opposite side yeah. <laughs> and then showing, <laughs> and showing someone that there is an opposite side and that they may not have fully considered the opposite side. Whether well, or not great I power comes that, great responsibility, yeah, right? Yeah. So Whether or not I right. believe in the opposite side or not can be, you know, that can be a meaningless distinction in the moment, uh, given that there might exist utility in just demonstrating the uh, the validity of an opposing argument, right? Right. So, Real quick, yeah. So, so you think about those trees. I think that's awesome. I really like that analogy. You got the trees, the forest, the leaves, the branches, and the, the trees. yeah. You can you can scale it out, right? Like, oh yeah. And so, the, talking about the scale is is al is also important too. You think about the, the 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 leaves, but then what are the leaves composed of? And maybe everything's composed of these cells. And if you can dig down there, then you can also. It, it also talks about, it, it comments on one's ability to, to narrow in on something as you get, you know, the branch, the tree, the forest, the, the, the land that the forest is on, the roots. Um, but it also, if you think about the tree or really um, any, any, like, any structure like that, we have that, that gravity well shape, that kind of top like shape. It, mm -hmm. it encompasses the leaf, it encompasses in a different kind of manifestation of that shape. But that's like the 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 saran wrap that could go around that would be kind of the representation of the, of all the the whole uh, have the tree have the leaf you know and it can all be encompassed in that and it all it all funnels down to the ground and then the roots are below a little bit and then that's about it in terms of uh, in terms of the living organism and then you have dirt and rock and bedrock and things like that uh, well that would be one conceptualization of it but we could also talk about fungus. And we can oh, also talk yeah. about the ecosystem. That you, so, like, I'm just saying that like, we, yeah. we can look at it as like tree versus ground, but then you could also look at ground as another network in which the. Tree oh yeah, yeah, is yeah. Because yeah, there has to be communication. Yeah, but it's it's it, I guess organic versus inorganic. If you have, I guess it's, you know. Anyway, I don't want to go too far with that, but I think <laughs> it's interesting how that 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 shape. It, but we could that we shape could. is is everywhere. With respect to the shape, I would say just uh, you know to plant a seed if you want to kind of. <laughs> How dare you! How dare you plant a seed? <laughs> if you want to continuously mull this over a little bit, I would consider taking that shape and you know turning it on its side such that it you know you have the time axis right, and then you have this gravity well shape, 
um, I guess, over time that would expand you. exponentially, yeah. right? So, but then take that, keep one of them, copy it, and flip it, right? So you actually have one going this way and the other going this way, that crossover, right? Yeah. Okay, so... They meet have, at the horn, meet at the, the opening of the horn? Yeah, but, and it, that, that structure is kind of constantly shifting because there's simultaneously patterns that as they move from the past to the present, exponentially increase in their surface area of connection to the present moment. And then there's the opposite structures which converge and collapse into a type of point in the present structure. And I would say that that's actually, think about it perceptually, like we'll tie it back to some of the first things we talked about. Um, so the types of structures that are um, connected to the present moment in um, the top of the funnel way, right? Their, their largest surface area is in the present. Um, that's like perceptual. That's for passing information back into the system. The other types of systems are convergent that try to collapse historical inertia or knowledge into present uh, information that may be used for action, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a constant flow between systems that are feeding back and feeding forward mm -hmm. in that manner, right? And they, they connect and they loop in that sense. Um, and create and they these form waves of sorts, right? Because as they as they interfere with yeah. the wave, they, well, exactly. And that interference creates an ambiguity with respect to you know, directionality, um, right? And 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 can start blurring the lines between you know the direction of, of information transmission. But well, yeah, we that, also that, have resonance, right? If we have waves, we have resonance, and we have our, if we have rev resonance, then we have the Tacoma Narrows Bridge problem. And if we have that, then shit can all fall apart if if things get too wacky too quick. And as as that uh, as that as that frequency increases, as information flows through the system more rapidly, then the chance and the probability that everything will fall to shit gets higher and lower at the same time. Yep. And so this metaphor is actually directly relevant to some of the the drawings that I showed you earlier. That yeah, I really want to see. I really want to sneak into your house and, and steal. Like, you know. <laughs> but I'm using <laughs> I'm using those conceptualized the idea of. Um, of reharmonizing these perceptual um, interference patterns, right? Would so, you? Um, would you? What could I do to make you feel comfortable sharing some of those with me? Because I, I, I can't, I can't draw on your your organization so much better than mine. But I, like, I think we're on the same page here. I feel like I, I want to see them. Like, what can I do? Can I pay? Can I give you a dollar? Can I subscribe to you on Patreon? Like, <laughs> can I? <laughs> what can I do, Matt? <laughs> well, I mean, if if you if you, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you not to subscribe to me on Patreon. But, <laughs> But uh, but I'm happy to share them. Just I, I can send I would, them to you. I can send them to you personally. I'm not. They're just they're in such a raw form that yeah. I don't necessarily feel comfortable sharing them that widely. So, so okay. that being on said, the, if this is on the internet, you know, somebody might be able to just anyhow like you know pause the frames and see them. Which oh sure, but I'm not sure how I even feel about that. But interesting. Um, well, I, I want to see him. It, it, like we could, we could set up offline uh, a way for you to share those with me and me to share things with you. Now, real quick, yeah, do you have a couple more minutes, or do you do you need to get on that as it starts? Um, I have a couple more minutes. They're gonna call me. It's not like it's just it's catching up with a previous business partner and, and okay, and checking in on a few projects that I'm advising on. So, um, so so real quick, so I wanted to talk about the the sharing and it, I, something I think is really important right now. We're we're having these conversations. We're recording them, um, but they're. They're, they're interesting to us and I would go and perhaps you would go and watch like a long form conversation like this. And, uh, but I, I think, I think there's a role of a digital architect, so to speak. I think we all need to kind of serve the role of a digital architect right now and, and, and it's, or, or not architect, but, uh, archeologist mm -hmm. as, as this information is being created. And so there's, I no literally just used that exact same metaphor about 18 hours ago. So. Yeah. Well, I think in, I in conversation. <laughs> yeah, it, with, with with a friend, with a person with whom I'm working to create effectively a podcast. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, as uh, well a podcast as well as a uh, as well as a network of creators and a network of uh, those who create connections between uh, connections between different domains of knowledge. Um, and that's what I was talking about in that email about trying to connect these, you know, those yeah. thoughts, but in an yeah. open, more open way than the, I don't want to throw them under the bus, but the Santa Fe Institute. Like, yeah. And we, so we, we have connections yeah. to the Santa Fe Institute and yeah. literally in the conversation last night, my friend was like, kind of like the Santa Fe Institute, but not behind a paywall. 
Right. Let me let me hop on let me hop on one of those calls, man. And if, yeah, if, if you, I mean, if you want to help help us, we're going to. I want to help. There, there are quite a few projects that are going to be associated with this effort, yeah, and I, I can imagine a few of those. Uh, but let me let me just mention so my 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 thing that at least the 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 initial idea of what I think would would help this is yeah. uh, is is a network of people like us, a small network, relatively small. I'm thinking like less than you mentioned the number ten thousand, maybe five hundred, maybe a thousand people. I don't know. But people that are truly interested in in these kinds of things and, and and thinking beyond out of the box, but not not wacky shit, not conspiratorial shit, but things that can be things that can be debated and things that are reasonable and logical and ma- maybe mathematically sound, logically sound, um, but not not strictly mathematical. And so we can think of you know all these ideas that we have. It's not like it's not like they're going to directly fix anything, but I think it's important that we get them get them indexed in a meaningful way because we're all having a similar conversation. And I think one thing that can happen is we have, let's say we have a, a 10 minute video. You will get with, with the kind of app website thing I'm thinking about, you'll get presented with a piece of content. And, yeah. and as you go through and just, you know, comment on, uh, categorize, um, classify the writer's uh, ability in terms of like, you know, uh, things as simple as grammar to as complex as, you know, connections and themes and flow and just all these abstract concepts. We, we rate this stuff and we give each other constructive feedback and we create not, not, not uh, echo chambers, but, but feedback loops that are really, really meaningful that we don't get yeah. in, in social media right now because you have all these articles to read. So if we, if we get paired with something that somebody's written or somebody's created that, uh, that aligns with the interests that we've declared ourselves create a profile, then in order to get to the next one, the feedback must be provided. Even if it's terrible, give them terrible feedback if that's what's warranted. But then the feedback that you give also relates to you and it must be constructive. It's not like this is shit, go away. It's, you know, there's lots of ways for you to improve this, 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 this. Um, and so a singular, um, singular content where you rate it and move on. It's not like Twitter or it's not like Tinder where you, you swipe, swipe, swipe. You well, give so- feedback. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think the, the way that I conceptualize these types of systems, and I agree that we need to start building mechanisms that serve this role. It's a, it, it's a, a connective tissue mm-hmm. between these emerging networks, uh, you know, um, networks of interest or networks of association that are mediated by, you know, this, this emerging conceptual domain. And we're all interested in this emerging conceptual domain. Yeah. And those, the, the connective tissue that exists now the incentive structures of those platforms have nothing to do with retaining a structural residue of what's happened on their platform in some meaningful way, right? Yeah. They're not building a structure out of it, right? It's constantly going into the ether. Like they keep some of it. Um, uh, is that, is that the guillotine? All yeah. right, man. So, um, So I'll, uh, I just, I'll, I'll call him back in, in two minutes. But okay. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to, um, just wrap that up. Uh, and so anyhow, we need, we need these systems that allow us to take conversations or take content and actually start building, uh, meaningful structures that are these constantly evolving, constantly, uh, re annealing and re, uh, they're living, they're living, they're yeah, it's, very, it's a living, it's a living knowledge structure. And so, yeah. One of the projects that I'm working on or starting to work on with my friend is also building uh, this type of project. And I have, I have some ideas for how to do that. And a platform like the type that you're talking about would plug in very nicely to the structure. So we should, we should continue that conversation. Um, I can, we, can, we can maybe like try to plug you into one of these conversations or, or like share some of these materials um, as, we, as we concretize it. Uh, but it's all highly related. Um, we should continue the conversation, but I should hop off to be a, you know, to be a good uh, advisor. (laughs) You got it, man. Absolutely wonderful talking to you. Thanks again for being flexible. And I really look forward to our next one. We want to go uh, three weeks or so. I can throw you in another invite or hopefully earlier than that. If if you got, well, actually we'll be in Italy, but um, (laughs) yeah, just whenever set, set something up for whenever you're, whenever you feel comfortable having a conversation after your wedding and, and, and your honeymoon, I suppose you're going on or whatever. We're, yeah, we're actually going on the trip. So we're going to do the honeymoon later. So it'll probably be uh, mid-May, uh, mid-May when we're back. But um, 
Yeah, man. Yeah. Thanks so much Just, for the talk. I'll, I'll set something up when I'm back and uh, looking okay. forward to picking up right back from here. So I'll go through your materials and I'll, I'll, I'll send some notes or something like that, or be in cool. contact about these structures that my, my other friend Brian and I are, are putting together because uh, yeah. you'll have input obviously. And um, more, more voices and more ideas are, Better than fewer, to an extent. <laughs> to an extent. Right. And let's think about ways yeah. to, to, really, yeah. to really boil down and to really extract the value from the feedback and not just have all comments in a Google Doc. You know, like for, for right. any feedback that you have, it's, it's going to be super valuable, but we need, we, need, we, we need a little bit more than that as, as it scales. So for anyway, sure. uh, enjoy the call. Thanks so much uh, for, for talking and uh, we'll talk to you soon, man. All right, later. All right, cheers, bye.